Vintage Drum Talk TV. Insightful interviews in the world of drumming. Hosted by Dan Schindler. This interview is from the Performance Master Series. Brought to you in part by Drums, Drummers, and Drumming. Today's guest is... Glenn Sobel. Hello and welcome to Drum Talk TV. I'm very happy to be sitting here, well not sitting here, but sitting remotely with Glenn Sobel. I'm in Mesquite, Nevada on the road. Glenn is in Los Angeles and very happy to have you here, Glenn. Thank you very much. And I just want to tell the audience a little bit about your career if there are maybe one or two people that have been living under a rock for the last 30 years. Uh, Glenn is not only on tour right now with Alice Cooper, but Glenn is a very accomplished drummer. And that's one of the reasons I'm so happy to bring him on this show is to expose you all to the fact that it's okay to play many different styles. Glenn <laughs> is not just a rock drummer. He's also a heavy metal drummer. He plays punk. He plays hip hop. He plays instrumental fusion. I mean, honestly, Glenn, I've got to tell you, after watching some videos of you and whatnot, listening to you, you are one of my new favorite drummers and that says uh, a lot well it says a lot because honestly a lot of my favorite drummers I've been following for 40 years or so and you're like a current um, contemporary which is great uh, Glenn is uh, playing on a wide range of things in 2007 there was a winner of American Idol um, Mr. Yamin who Glenn played with Right? And you also are on the current new version of ESPN's Monday Night Football. That, that's a bit of immortalization right there, I think. That's really cool. You played on Paul Gilbert's Instrumental Fusion CD. Uh, just a that wide range. DVD. DVD. DVD, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. So I, make sure the, the guy that played on that particular record that came out before the DVD, that was Jeff Bowers, another great LA rock right. guy. Absolutely. And um, I think what's so cool beyond all of that is that you are a teacher and you teach at the Percussion Institute of Technology and you also teach at the Los Angeles Music Academy, which is great. I mean, that's, that's huge. I haven't taught at uh, LAMA in a while, but yeah, I definitely have been at MI, I don't know, since the 90s, at Musicians Institute, that's which cool. is also the drum department used to be called Percussion Institute of Technology. Now it's just called the Drum Program at Musicians Institute. Right. They, they had to just sum it up, I guess, right? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll, I'd like to ask you about that first. As a drum teacher, Glenn, what is your perspective on, you know, there, there's people following my, my stuff from 70 plus countries. Some of them are new to drumming. Some of them have been playing 20, 30, 40 plus years like you and I. As a teacher, Glenn, what are some of the most important basics that you think new drummers should learn and what veteran, quote, what they think or veteran drummers should pay attention to? What's your perspective on that? Don't get me started. <laughs> No, okay, you know, there's a lot of places you can go with that, but you know, if you want to be great, you got to listen to the greats. You got your your obvious people, your John Bonhams, Keith Moon, Neil Peart, Mitch Mitchell, Ian Pace, Cozy Powell, you can go on forever. Many but, of my favorites, huh? by the way. What's that? Many of my favorites, by the way. Of course, yeah, and they, they should be. These are all the obvious choices. and. I, I kind of get together with students, if it's a first time guy, I, I try to assess their knowledge of, of the classics, the roots. Because if you don't have that, then you don't know where it's been. You can't take it anywhere. There's no point of reference if you don't know how to play certain classic grooves. If you want to learn how to play a great rock shuffle, well, if they come to me wanting to learn that, I say, well, have you ever heard uh, Boz Skaggs, the Lido Shuffle with Jeff or Carl? Do you know... Uh, Pride and Joy by Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, that's Chris Layton, do you know? And I just start asking about, do they know this? And if it's a lot of, no, no, I've never heard of this, I say, well, this is your homework. You have to do the listening. 
That's play great. These parts play to these records. That's awesome because I I appreciate so much that I think your philosophy is that as drummers and percussionists, we need a wide range of influence to, like you say, have a point of reference. You don't know what one thing means, and that one thing being a beat or a rudiment or a feel or a groove, you don't know what that means unless it has some sort of reference within the whole spectrum. And if you don't understand the spectrum, how could you have the point of reference? Yeah, playing rudiments and learning rudiments to a lot of kids, that's like eating their vegetables. They have to learn how to play a double paradiddle. They don't know why. Right. It's up to a teacher to show them what you can do, and this is why, you know, and I can name some songs where, you know, a double paradiddle was used to create some really killer sounding group, but without that, that drummer wouldn't be able to come up with that. So, right. they could all be tied together. It's just about not forgetting that this is about playing music. There's a lot of players that get caught up in technique and speed, and I get it. When you're young, that's what you're into. You're, you're into playing fast. And uh, it's like a race, and it is important to be able to play with some speed, but it's also important to be able to play slow. That's gonna be harder for a lot of people. Playing slow is a lot of space between the notes. And maybe a lot of people don't appreciate that until it's too late. They may be in the studio with, uh, with a certain group or producer, and there's some even slow mid-tempo, medium slow, and they're having a tough time because they've never practiced it before. Right. You know, that's a really good point. I've done a couple clinics recently on my page. Uh, one of them is called Slow and Low, which is all about, hey, when's the last time you took half an hour a week to just practice a slow beat? Another one is called Creating Space, and they they point really to exactly what you're saying, Glenn. And if you look at uh, Vinnie Caliuta, Peter Erskine, you know, that have are monster drummers that have laid back and played in the pocket just right with feel and taste and finesse with Steely Dan. That's a perfect testament to exactly what you're saying. Yeah, Steely Dan, there's a great group play along to the classics. You're going to learn how to play a really great halftime shuffle if you play along to Babylon Sisters. Everybody plays that kind of thing different. You're going to get the Bernard Purdy's take on that. Uh, and there's some really slow tempos. And the only way to really learn and be comfortable with that is to do the listening. You got to you got to be obsessed with this stuff. You got to really you got to be kind of an encyclopedia of music, a historian in a way. You got to you got to know your stuff. It's it's a lot more than just rudiments and exercises. And so that's where I've been really trying to take it in my teaching the last few years. It's, it's important to have certain techniques and rudiments, but let's not forget what we're doing with all this stuff. Right. And, and you know what, Glenn, to your point, um, you're on tour right now with Alice Cooper. And we'll get to that in depth in a moment. Before we do, as sort of a contrast to that, um, you know, let's face it, Alice Cooper hard rock he's an icon in that department but i watched you play this video at the guitar center clinic you did for mapex in fountain valley playing fast or never i watched it over and over and effing over because it's the the instrumental fusion your finesse with that please tell everybody whether they're young drummers or veteran drummers why have that dichotomy of being able to slam away with Alice Cooper and also be able to play with the finesse you did on Faster or Never and why they're related? Explain that, please. Um, I remember that drum clinic because that was, I think, the first time I'd ever performed that, that Faster or Never. I, I don't even call that a song. That's like a collection of sequences that I put together at my friend's studio just to kind of have something for a drum clinic. It's purely a vehicle to show off at a drum clinic. It's like that though that kind of music that's been made fun of by that guy on Saturday Night Live. Uh, you know that guy he's a drummer and he made a video kind of making fun of instructional DVD. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. You know, it's it's a total it's like its own genre of drum clinic music. Who else would listen to that but drummers? But right? drummers, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's right. it's kind of like a drum and bass in the beginning that it goes off into some other weird things. It's fun and I love playing that stuff, but you know, it's, it's sometimes there's a lot more to life than that. It's not sexy, you know. I, I love to play the big rock gig because that's what I grew up on. I, I know and appreciate what a great rock show can be and it really has very little to do with with uh, playing complex rudimental patterns. That's You gotta be a different guy 
if you're going to play on a, a big rock gig, an Alice gig or whatever, you really have to put on a different hat. It's like being an actor in a way. You, you, I'm genuine with all those styles. I love doing it. I, I don't know if I have a favorite genre, but they, they are polar opposites in a way. Or the Elliot Yameen gig, that was a, a pop R&B thing, and I, I got a lot out of that. And I had to be a different guy for that, not just musically, but also kind of personality-wise in a way. And you don't ever want to be a phony or fake. That's, that's not... I get by in this business of music, right. but it, it really, it, every gig takes on its own set of circumstances and uh, musical uh, parts that you're playing. It's all going to be really different. I, I appreciate the, the fact that you, you recognize that. I appreciate Thank you. Oh, well, sure. You're welcome. And, you know, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And I think your thank you is a testament that it's something that really most of all drummers and hardcore musicians could really appreciate. And before I ask you another question regarding genres, I want to drop in the video faster than ever that we've been talking about. So guys, everybody watching, guys and girls, sit back, relax a moment, and check this. That was the first time I played that tune. Okay, cool. It's been way better since then. <laughs> Just well, whatever. whatever. <laughs> so here it is, faster than ever. So that was Glenn Sobel, faster than ever, just flailing away with 
finesse. And now I want to ask you that question, Glenn, regarding genres. And, you know, maybe this is sort of a cross question. Regarding genres or purely musical experiences as a drummer, and I don't want to put you on the spot because I know you're on tour with Alice Cooper right now. I don't want you to piss anybody off. But what what is your favorite thing to play and what is the most absolute, most memorable experience as a drummer? And I don't just mean on a stage. It could be in the studio. It could be an epiphany you had while you were practicing by yourself and you realized a, a trick. You know, what's the most, what means the most to you as an experience as the drummer that you are? Well, the last year and a half has been hard to beat for those types of experiences because what's been great about the Alice gig is that we've been put into a lot of situations as a band where we're playing these events. Sometimes they're like a, a charity event or maybe one of those special last minute uh, announced club gigs in London or LA where all of a sudden there's special guests. And, right. and these are like some amazing guests. Like uh, last April, we played the Hollywood premiere party for Johnny Depp's latest movie, uh, Dark Shadows. Oh, wow. And this was the second time that Johnny Depp joined us on stage to play right, guitar. I saw that picture of you with him. We'll drop it in right here. There's Johnny Depp with Glenn Sobel. What's up with that? How do those two worlds come together? Well, uh, Johnny's been friends with Alice for a while, and originally when he moved to L.A., he was, in a, he was in a band. He was trying to make it as a musician, and then all of a sudden this acting thing, he got sidetracked with that, and it kind of worked out pretty well for him. But he loves to play. He's, he's jammed with uh, a lot of people like, like Marilyn Manson and, and Aerosmith. So anyways, that was the second time he had played with us last April, for the first time being London at a small last-minute announced club gig. And it's just, there's been situations like that. We were playing with him and then also Steven Tyler got up and we did uh, we did Come Together. And Joe Perry actually joined us for that too. Oh, cool. This the second time that Steven Tyler had played with us. Last New Year's in Maui, we did Alice's manager's annual New Year's charity benefit. And so there's a clip on YouTube you can see. It's, uh, we're playing Come Together by the Beatles. And again, we're the house band in this situation. And so trading vocals is Alice, Steven Tyler, and Weird Al at this gig. <laughs> and then in addition to that, we played with Weird Al. We did a couple of his songs. We did a couple of Aerosmith songs with Steven. Uh, who else joined us? Uh, Pat and, and Michael from the Doobie Brothers. Pat Simmons and Michael McDonald. We did, like, Blackwater and Taking It to the Streets. Uh, wow. Yeah, we had all these special guests. And, like, Clint Eastwood's there and Tom Arnold's MC. It's one of those moments where you just go, like, how the hell did this happen? Yeah, and it's, like you said, it's hard to beat that. How do you pick a favorite? And I know that's kind of putting you on the spot to, to ask you that. Of, there's been a bunch of those kind of uh, of uh, circumstances in the year. We've, we've played in the last year and a half. We've played with Benefits with Rob Halford. We became the house band and did a Judas preset with him. And, and Kesha and Robbie Krieger, we played with him at the Whiskey Plant Doors song. Wow. It was pretty, pretty crazy, you know. And rehearsals are just as fun as the gigs. That's what has been interesting to me. It's like they're both equal as far as I'm concerned. If you, if you come in prepared and these people appreciate that and they show that they're having a good time at the rehearsal, you've done a good job. So in addition to the great stuff with Alice, one of the other great uh, maybe epiphanies and great times in a way was a couple of years ago I was called the very last minute to sub on this gig in Italy. It's an artist named Vasco Rossi, and he's the biggest rock star by far in Italy. It's all stadiums and arenas. And I had heard of him because he's had uh, live drummers. He's had Kenny Aronoff and Dean Castronova, Jonathan Moffat. They all toured with him. And oh, wow. Vin Vinny's done the records and Greg Bissonette's done the records. And his current drummer is a great player named Matt Log, who if you don't know who that is, you've heard of him. He's on like so many hit records, like a lot of more sets, first album. But oh, he, yeah. he had an injury. And uh, this one producer I did one session for in L.A. like two years prior to that that I didn't talk too much. I thought maybe he didn't like me. I don't know. But I did one session for him. He called me out of the blue and said, can you get on a plane to Italy in three days? There's this huge artist over there and so-and-so can't make it. And I had a feeling he was talking about Vasco because I hadn't heard of this guy before. And right. sure, that's who it was. And I had to learn 26 songs in three days. And I knew that the pressure was on because this whole tour was sold out and there's 70 people on the crew. It's a huge production. And so it's like I'm, I'm the kind of odd man out. I'm the wild card. I know that the pressure's on, but... 
doing that enough, you, you get used to walking into rooms filled with skeptical people. And I just thinking, okay, I'm flying all the way over there. I just want to play. I want to get to that first rehearsal. And I stayed right. for 48 hours learning the songs. I had a gig the night before I left. But the point is, I came in prepared. I was on the plane. I didn't sleep because I knew that I was not on the list to begin with. And then they went to the key. And it's like, I've made it somehow on that list. I'm going to kill this, and I'm going to make everybody rest assured that the tour is going to be fine. And it all worked out fine. And, and the first show came off with, like, one little mistake that probably wasn't noticed by anybody. And it, the first show was the biggest. It was this show in Sardinia, the island. And it was yeah. so windy outside. It's like 40,000 people. And you can see this stuff on YouTube. I put up, a like, a tour diary. If you type in my name in Italy, you can find that. But... Um, it was so windy, and I had the music stand uh, next to me, and the drum tech had these clothes pins to uh, hold the page down. And then he had to turn the page for me. The song would segue to each other, but I was so determined to just kill this and prove that I'm the guy that made the right decision. You know, that's to me, it was like one of those things where it's like, wow, I did it. I, I made it through this. It, it was this huge confidence boost. That's so important is having the confidence to know that you can go in and just make things happen. And I can't say that there was nerves, but I was very concerned. I just wanted to play the show already. Right. Yeah. That, that's, that's such a good subject, Glenn, because you raise um, a whole other issue with that. And, and as I bring that up, I'll mention to everybody watching that Glenn is known for being able to step in and learn a set's worth of music for a concert tour within a day or two. He's known for learning a CD's worth of music within a couple days or so. Kind of along the school of Alan White, one of my favorite drummers who I've had the absolute pleasure, pleasure of becoming friends with and spending time with, who of course played with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. He played with George Harrison. He was with Mad Dogs and Englishmen with uh, Joe Cocker and Leon Russell. And of course, he's been with Yes for over 40 years. Just an amazing drummer. What's that? Hills, didn't he? Yes, absolutely. And he joined Yes two weeks before the Close to the Edge tour in 1972-73. So being in the same position, and coincidentally, I'm certainly no Alan White, but I was asked to go on my first tour a week before the tour started and I knew none of the material. So the question I want to ask you based on all that is how much of it do you prepare, and this is for you to voice to students, how much do you prepare to be able to read the music versus being able to train yourself to learn by ear and feel and intuition? What's your take on that, Glenn? You're talking about situations where you're called to fill in kind of last minute. Fill in last minute or get hired for a gig last minute, exactly. Yeah, well, when it comes to things like that, you got to remember that the whole band is used to hearing the music a certain way for a matter of weeks, months, years. And so my whole thing is I am going to try and mimic this player as best as I can. And I, I make charts. It has to do with reading music, but I'm not transcribing. I'm making cheat sheets. Here's the kick snare pattern for eight bars in the first verse. It's the same in the second verse, but the second verse, verse is nine bars. You have to notate all that stuff, and then you can kind of figure out what the key fills are that sound like they're important to the song. You don't want to try and change things. You don't want to be a hot shot and try to throw your own spin on things in the beginning. You just want the whole band to feel like they've always felt with these songs. Because if it's a last minute thing... You want to keep the integrity of yeah. in the music and the composition, exactly. right? Exactly. And a lot of these gigs, uh, well, like so many gigs nowadays, they're, they're run with backing tracks. And that's actually, that's actually a good thing because it takes, it takes the burden off of the drummer to get the exact right tempo or count off. And I remember with that one particular Italian gig, maybe like uh, almost one quarter of the songs had backing tracks. Some of them I was able to play the click track. Others, there was a bass or guitar intro that would set the tempo. And... Um, yeah, I was pretty okay with that, but it is a comfortable thing to to play to some kind of click when you're filling in because now you just you know you're right as far as tempo goes. It's just about all the other stuff, and there's a lot of details that you might not realize when you first listen until you start learning. You're like, oh wow, okay, like this bridge is five bars long. It's kind of weird, and don't make the mistake of only playing four bars. You got to actually do some physical counting. And then there's retards at the end of songs. I wanted to get those exactly like they 
sound on the record. And the best compliment you can get is for somebody to say, wow, I almost forgot that was you back there. <laughs> you know, That's great. Feels like you know, our other guy, you know, and, and as time goes on, if you play on the game long enough, you can start taking little liberties with the tunes, but that's not the point in the beginning. When you get called to sub, they're calling you because uh, they're in trouble and right, they need right. you to kind of save the day. So no hot shot. Right. No, that that's a great answer. Um, and as I segue into one last question before we kind of wrap it up, uh, before the last question, I want to ask you, what would you divide the percentage up to be? And this is different for everybody, Glenn, but in your case, what is the percentage reading tablatures and, and notation versus learning by ear and just and listening in the record of the CD over and over and over and knowing the composition? How would you divide that percentage up for how it works for you? Well, the percentage, is, it's hard to say because it depends on how much time you have and how many songs there are. True. The act of writing it out and, and making your charts, that's going to help you remember because then you can visualize the chart later. And, uh, you know, maybe it's, it could be 75, 80% that's, that's on the chart and then the rest of it, I've, I've listened to the songs and if you really got to become like obsessed, you have to live with these songs, even if you only have a couple of days. I was on that airplane flying to Italy and I was, I was looking at my charts and listening to each song twice through and just visualizing myself playing these songs. And I'd make any other little fine tuning with my pen and eraser and pencil and everything. And yellow highlighter, I use those too. I highlight the choruses because the music stand, it's usually to my left and on the chorus a lot. You're on the ride, you're riding on a crash, and then you have to look back at the music over here and you got to find your place. So I've gotten used to doing that using the, the yellow highlighter. Maybe 75, 80% is notated. If it's a really loose structure, you're playing basic stuff and a lot of drummers don't work on these fills. They don't have a library in their head of like those most simple song-oriented fills and they wonder why they can't get a gig. They think, <laughs> right. they think people below them to, uh, to play something so simple, but no, I just think, okay, all right, more work for me. This guy doesn't want to play, you know, brackum, brackum, something so simple as that. And, and, and there's so many different ways to play that. And I think the message in here, folks, and Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the message in here is still, even with a simple beat, is keeping the integrity of how it was originally played. Because you could take a simple beat, and is it John Bonham playing it, or is it Peter Erskine playing it? There's two different ways to play the most, there's a million different ways to play the most simplest beat. And you've got to school yourself and listen to how it's being played. Yeah, that's an important point. You know, sometimes you got to do that. You got to say, "How would John Bonham play this? How would David Grohl approach this?" Because that's how I'm going to think when I'm uh, when I'm playing this groove. The attitude is is a huge part of rock playing. There's a lot of drummers that are working on being uh, a working rock player, but they don't have the volume and the attitude in their playing. And that's an important thing. They go through school, maybe playing in some jazz bands or concert band in high school, and they're used to teachers going, Shh, "Drummers, you're too loud," and they just it just becomes this thing, oh, drums are just always loud. But now sometimes you have to practice playing loud. And you got to listen and go see some of these guys live. It's one thing to listen or watch on a little YouTube screen. Witness them playing live and just try to feed off of the energy that they're putting out. Not what they're playing, but how they're playing and how it feels. And think about the stick size. You know, there's just all these things that I see a lot of drummers like at MI, students coming in. They want to be rock guys, but they're not really playing with much of a... AC, DC sort of classic rock grit and grease and attitude. They're too proper about it. You have to learn to become that kind of person by doing the listen. You know, go to some concerts, see why people react to this stuff. They don't care that something was some weird sticking pattern. That's not what they're there for. They're there to have a good time and you gotta know why rock and roll feels like it does. Right, and I think this is a very good listen for not only those that are because there's some people watching this that are saying well i'm not going to get asked to sub for this guy or that guy or glenn sobel playing for alice cooper but if you're playing in a wedding band if you're playing copies or cover tunes at a club or something this game the same school of thought applies where if you pay attention to the integrity of the music and whatnot you'll be able to play these songs in the spirit of those songs which really the definition is 
verbatim and you'll sound better. People will recognize it better. They'll think you're playing it better because you'll sound like the song they grew up with and know. I love cover gigs. I, I love doing that because you get to now like get inside the mind of that drummer to play that track and you're, you're learning the fills and it's adding to your play. It's a great thing. I play small places around town with Vivian Campbell out here a lot. He's a oh, wow. guitar player and he's played in Dio, of course, in White State. He was in Dio for years, yeah. We play like the baked potato, you know, or other, like the cantina in Calabasas out here, we play there. And we're playing a lot of like old school Fleetwood Mac, you know, the Peter Green era Fleetwood Mac. Uh, we play a lot of Thin Lizzy, because Vivian was in that band for a while last year. Right. right. And we play like Rory Gallagher, and just all these fun songs. What a range. Yeah, it just goes to show you. I mean, he's a guy that for 30 years he's been playing huge festivals and arenas, but he likes to just play the blues and play some covers. That's a great attitude, a great way to be. I love it. We all love it. And it, it always is going to add to your playing to learn more songs. That's what it's about. That kind of comes back around to the beginning of what we were talking about. What we were talking about. Right. Absolutely. So, i got to ask you this. On behalf of all drummers all over the world, Glenn, with your experience in so many different genres of music, rock, heavy metal, punk, hip hop, fusion, it goes on and on, playing with a soundtrack to Monday Night Freaking Football, Glenn. How immortalizing is that? I gotta ask you, tell the drummers out there how important it is to become cohesive as a rhythm section with the bass player. What, in essence, is the relationship? Define the rhythm section. Well, I would involve guitar in that as well. Okay. As I mean, guitar, most of the time, what they're doing is they're playing rhythms. They get to play leads in almost every song. But, yeah, all three of that together, it's you got to feel time the same way. There's going to be certain guys that play really well together and their styles mesh really well together. There's going to be other guys where maybe there's a little bit of a tug of war. But as a drummer, you got to just learn how to feed off of that and, and feel where they're going with it. Like, as far as, like, some of the guitar players, a good example I can think of is like Chris Pelletieri. That's a guy I've played with on and off for years, mostly in Japan. Toured. But, you know, he's a very fast, shredded guitar player. He plays very on top of the beat, very forward motion, everything he does. But on the other hand, someone like Paul Gilbert, also an amazing shredding guitar player. He's, he's, uh, he's influenced so many people. He has more of a laid back sound and feel to what he does. He's almost like, you know, this shredding guy that's influenced by Jimi Hendrix and Robin Trower, you right. know, where Chris is coming from, like, uh, Richie Blackmore, Randy Rhodes side of things. And so you got to recognize that. And, again, it comes with being just really well-versed in all of your classic rock. And you can hear the references in people's playing. And you kind of – you use all that. You put it together. And you, you do your best to interpret how to, to play. And usually, hopefully, it's going to work out well. You're just going to know right away – that it, it just feels comfortable to, to play with these people, whoever they might be, bass, guitar, whatever. Everybody feels time different, but I think once you uh, have played even for a few minutes, it, it's kind of pretty well known where it's going. And I think what's interesting is there's certain bands, over time, the whole band itself develops its own sense of time. Certain uh, certain acts like the, I can think of two offhand, um, like Anvil, right? our Canadian buddies up there, we did a bunch of, Shows they were open for us in Canada last year. Those guys are amazing. The guitar player and drummer, Lips and Rob, they just play together. And it's like they speed up and slow down together. It's amazing to me that they can do that. The cohesiveness is there. What's that? The cohesiveness is there. They really. play so long. They, just, they can probably finish each other's sentences musically. But, right. yeah, they develop right. their own sense of time. And then, like, strung out. Uh, it's a band from where I'm... My area was still a very popular punk band that influenced everybody. They they still do really well, but the band, if you hear them play, they, they, it all breathes together. And I think that's pretty amazing. It's a really good buddy of mine, Jordan Burns on drums. He's one of the most amazing punk drummers you'll ever see. And uh, yeah, the band really has a unique thing going on. I think that's pretty cool. Very cool. So I have to ask you, after after going through that, and that's a great answer. Thank you for schooling everybody on that. Who's your favorite rhythm section? Oh, man, there's so many. I mean, pick one. Pick one. One. Gun to your head, Glenn. Who is we'll it? We'll make it real easy. Bonham and John Paul Jones. Come Thank on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. There's so many others, but 
but there are simple. We know that that's one of the greatest. And if you're a drummer and bassist, you have to you have to listen to that. You want to rock, then you gotta you gotta know every Zeppelin tune. You not know no, no but. You know what? I got to give it up for that and for John Paul Jones because John Paul said in an interview not too long ago, he said, I'm blessed with being 50% of the greatest rhythm section on the planet. And I don't take that as a cocky statement or or pompous or anything. I, I, yeah, he can say that. And I think it's because he's been told so much. You know, I, I believe from what I've read of the man and from what I've seen on video and film, he's a very humble, laid back guy. But he's been told that so much that he finally bought into it and said, you know what, I guess you're all right. It's it's me and John, you know, and look at the legacy they left behind. And now what he's doing, this is a whole other interview, Glenn, but what he's doing now with them crooked vultures, you know, here he is in the 21st century playing with guys that are young enough to be his kids, and he's right there with them. I've heard some of that stuff. It's really great. It is. And, it's cool. and now, you know, we're talking about all this music. The beautiful thing is we have a thing now with like Spotify, the, the music streaming service. It's too easy now to check out all this stuff. I think that's, as a drum teacher, that's something I tell students. I, I haven't taught a whole lot lately, but... I started to tell them, you got to have Spotify. You know, me or someone else is going to recommend a song, and I can hear it instantly. There's no excuse now to not do the listening and the homework. Right, exactly. Well, Glenn, I, first of all, I want to thank you very much for coming on Drum Talk TV on Dan's Drum Clinics. I really appreciate it. I know the audience appreciates it. This is great. And I want to invite you in the future for the two of us to get together in person, whether it's me in L.A. with you or it's you out in Vegas at my place where I live and where I'm based and actually do a couple clinics on my kit or your kit so that it's more than just an interview, but people can see Glenn Sobel in action teaching what you believe is most important for young and vin uh, veteran drummers to learn. That'd be great. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we will meet. I know that with Alice we have a Vegas gig at the Palms, I think it's around November 27th. I could be wrong, but I know it's late November. Okay, let me know, that's great. My wife and I would be happy to be there. I'd be happy to get together with you, whether it's around that time or after the tour settles down and the dust settles, we get together, I'll come out to LA, come out to Vegas, whatever it is, and hopefully Glenn Sobel will be doing a clinic on Dan's Drum Clinics. Thanks again for joining us and spreading the word, the real word. Sticking it to Thanks, me, Dan. Glenn. Thanks, bro. Love you, man.